Bonjour everybody, this is Q, and today we're taking a look at one of the most mysterious and advanced mechanisms in history, often considered the first analog computer, the Antikythera mechanism. History is full of mysteries. Many historians devoted their lives to try and understand all the lost knowledge our ancestors developed through centuries of learning. Although there has been a lot of transcripts and writings about technology since approximately the 12th century, there are other periods of history where it's almost impossible to find any information that would help us understand the level of advancement people had at that time. When we talk about lost technology and advancement, two periods usually come to mind the ancient Greece and the Egyptians. Everybody today agrees that these two civilizations, amongst others like Mayas for instance, knew things we probably still don't even comprehend today. The mechanism we'll talk about today is one of them, and it's been miraculously found in Greece in 1902, at the bottom of the sea around the island of Antikythera. I won't spend too much time on history, simply because there already are many documentaries that explain it very well, more in depth and using better pictures. I'll put links to my favorites in the description of the video as well as the sources I used to understand and learn about the mechanism and the finds around it. My goal in this video is to focus on explaining the actual workings of the mechanism, how all the gears work together to achieve what it took the scientists more than 1600 years to reproduce. Before we go any further, I also add that I'm using Fusion 360 to model everything. I chose to use this software in all my videos because it's the first of its kind to be available for a very low price, being even free for students and hobbyists. As we'll see later in the video, there are some limits to what Fusion 360 can do for now, but my aim is to show that anybody could start learning and enjoying 3D modeling on a very powerful, neat and affordable tool. As stated before, in 1902, a group of sponge divers found the ancient object of the Isle of Antikythera in Greece. It was part of a shipwreck and found along with many objects dated to be more than 2000 years old, like statues and amphors. The mechanism was recovered in three main parts, along with much smaller fragments, all of which survived underwater for thousands of years. The whole mechanism only measures about 34 by 18 by 9 cm. It was clearly designed to be portable. Though its origin is a mystery, scientific researchers have learned much from studying the device. It took 50 years for a scientist to start studying the device, simply because one of the archaeologists that was part of the first expedition believed that it was too complex to have been constructed during the same period as the other pieces that had been discovered in the same wreckage. In 1951, British science historian Derek J. De Sola Price began studies on the mechanical workings of the device. He is the scientist that brought attention to the mechanism by explaining to the world that the mechanism is in fact an astrological device used to track the movement of stars and planets. Two decades later, in 1971, Price teamed with nuclear physics professor Charolampos Karakalos to complete a series of X-rays for analysis. This led to a more complete model and for the first time since the period the mechanism was made, we understood the system functioned through a series of differential gear arrangements that enabled the device to calculate the position of the stars, sun, moon and other astrological information based on the future date the user entered. In recent years, Michael Wright, a curator of mechanical engineering, compiled further data on the Antikythera mechanism, suggesting the device may have been more complex than Price's original analysis suggested. Wright constructed a working model, which indicates that the device may also have worked differently than originally believed. The advanced state of corrosion has made it impossible to perform an accurate compositional analysis, but it is believed that the device was made of bronze alloy, all of which was contained in a wooden box. A big question remains unanswered. When was this mechanism made, and by who? Many researchers have brought forward potential clues like, for instance, the age of the statues found on the same shipwreck, or even dating coins found there too. 
The mechanism is believed to date from between 276 BC. So why? Why did the Greeks need such a mechanism? Why would the people living during that age need a machine that can predict the position of the Sun, the Moon, several planets and even eclipses? The mechanism was actually used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses for calendar and astrological purposes, decades in advance. It could also be used to track the four-year cycle of athletic games, which was similar to an Olympiad, the cycle of the ancient Olympic Games. Although investigations are still happening today by the members of the so-called Antikythera Mechanism Research Project, we now have 82 fragments and enough information to create a model that would illustrate all the findings that happened since 1951. There are two main parts to the mechanism. The first part, that will develop straight after, was found underwater and was clearly identified through the 60 years of investigation on the device. The second part is missing, and they are the parts that drove the planetary pointers, leading to debate about how exactly they moved. Because planets orbit the Sun, when viewed from the Earth, they appear to wander back and forth in the sky. The Greeks explained this motion with epicycles, small circles superimposed on a larger orbit. According to Michael Wright, who has studied the mechanism longer than anyone, it modeled epicycles with trains of small gears riding around larger ones. To make the model we'll talk about in this video, I chose the latest model developed by Freeth and Jones in 2012, closely based on the work from Michael Wright, but adapted to respect more accurately the skill set Greeks had in 200 BC. To explain the mechanism, we'll use the model I built in Fusion 360. We'll explain the mechanism as if it was a known and mastered technology, as if we knew exactly how it works. This allows us to focus on the workings of the gearings and how the inventor of this machine solved the problems that came with trying to represent the sky with mechanical components. On the front of the mechanism, there's what we can observe. The outer dial has 365 divisions representing the days in the Egyptian solar calendar, which is divided into 12 months, with each month containing 3 weeks and each week containing 10 days. Five intercalary days were added at the end of the year to total 365 days. Unlike today, there was no leap day adjustment every fourth year, which meant that over time the year moved gradually through the seasons. It was, for this reason, commonly referred to as the wandering year. Right underneath the dial are 365 holes, which enabled the dial plate to be fixed in any position in increments of single days. This allowed for the dial to be rotated so the year can follow the seasons. Every four years, or four complete rotation of the sun pointer, the dial would be rotated by one day. The inner dial is divided equally into 12 sections, which represent the zodiac constellations for which the sun travels through each year. One full turn of the sun pointer, which also indicates the date on the outer dial, represents one solar year and forms the basis of the gearing ratio of every subsequent pointer in the mechanism, like the Moon and the other planets. There also are two dials at the back, but we'll develop them later when we come to the associated pointers. The mechanism was operated by turning a small hand crank, not lost, which was linked via crown gear to the largest gear, the four-spoked gear visible on the front of fragment A named B1. The crank moves the date pointer about 78 days per full rotation, so heating a particular day on the dial would be easily possible if the mechanism were in good working condition. The action of turning the hand crank would also cause all interlocked gears within the mechanism to rotate, resulting in a simultaneous calculation of the position of the sun and moon, the moon phase, eclipses and calendar cycles and, perhaps, the locations of planets, as discussed earlier. To make the explanation as straightforward as possible and because I love organization, we'll look at everything the mechanism can do and explain them all one by one. As you probably realize, this video will be a little bit different. I won't show any of the modeling for a few simple reasons. First off, there are about 30 hours of pure modeling recording. I also found it relatively uninteresting for you guys to watch it as it's pretty repetitive. 
It takes a very long time to figure out everything because I followed several plans and papers explaining how it all works, but the actual technical modeling is simple. It all comes down to extrusions, integration of gears, and a good amount of geometry to place all the components on the plates. If anything, the biggest challenge in this model that consists of over 60 gears is the organization. It's very important to keep track of all the gears, all the joints with the other parts, and try to keep everything clean, as finding a problem later on promises to be challenging. Instead, in this video, I will use the model I made of the mechanism and show you each chain of components that makes each feature. It will allow us to get more time to talk about how the inventor solved each problem and how it all works, instead of focusing on how I modeled it in Fusion 360. As I said before, I'll integrate the five planets in my model, following Wright's model. Okay, let's start. The Antikythera mechanism can do the following. By using a manual input to indicate the day, it gives the user, on the front dial, the current date, the position of the sun, the position of the moon, its face, as well as the position of five planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, the only planets that were known in ancient Greece. These positions on the front dial are all based on a geocentric model, meaning the Moon, the Sun, as well as all the other planets, are revolving around the Earth. This model was commonly believed in ancient Greece. Although we now know this model is wrong and we live in a heliocentric world, the Sun is at the center of our system, the position of the Moon, the Sun and the five planets is still relevant regardless of the model used, within the error factors of the mechanism. On the back dial, the user can observe tracking of the Metonic calendar, tracking of the Calipic cycle, equal to four Metonic cycles, timing of several Panhellenic Thetic games, including the ancient Olympic games, prediction of solar eclipses with the Saros dial, and another dial, the Exoligmos dial, that allows to correct the Saros dial to the hour. Now that we have a general idea of what the mechanism does, let's dive into each feature and show, thanks to the 3D model, how it all comes together and why this system is truly fascinating. Just a last note before we start, I won't go into too many details when talking about each feature and why it's been made like that. My goal here is to explain to a large audience that doesn't necessarily have experience in mechanical engineering or astronomy and is just willing to see what we call the Antikythera mechanism the first computer ever made. I will therefore try to simplify the explanations on purpose. First component we need to build is the frame. I use the dimensions I talked about earlier. The frame is really simple, it only has three plates, front, back and middle plate. So let's start with the start, the input. As we explained earlier, the input is manual. The user of the mechanism rotates the handle to point at a certain day using the current date pointer on the front face. The handle is linked to a 48 teeth crown gear, which means its teeth project at right angle to the face of the wheel. This gear meshes with the main gear we talked about earlier, the gear B1, with 223 teeth. Every single gear train in the mechanism is linked to this gear. Let's see why this very specific number 223 is used by looking at the back dial. The Saros dial is the main lower spiral dial on the rear of the mechanism. The Saros cycle is 18 years, 11 days and 8 hours, which is very very close to 223 Sidonic month. The sidereal month is the time the moon takes to complete one full rotation around the earth with respect to the background stars. However, because the Earth is constantly moving along its orbit around the Sun, the Moon must travel slightly more than 360 degrees to get from one new Moon to the next. Thus, the synodic month, or lunar month, is longer than the sidereal month. A sidereal month lasts 27.322 days, while a synodic month lasts 29.531 days. It is defined as the cycle of repetition of the positions required to cause 
solar and lunar eclipses and therefore it could be used to predict them. Not only the month, but the day and even the time of the day. The Saros dial consists of a spiral of four turns and so the Saros pointer would need to rotate four times to complete the Saros cycle, which lasts 223 synodic months. Without going into too many details about the gearing ratio, a gear train connects the main gear B1 with 223 teeth to the Saros dial. The ratio used is actually 940 over 4237. If you're interested in understanding why these numbers, I'll also link the papers I used to make this video in the description. To make it simple, the Saros cycle allows to predict eclipses. Depending on the day the user points at, there will or will not be an eclipse on that day, and a quick look at the Saros pointer allows to find out exactly what kind of eclipse and at what time of the day it will happen. The hour markings in each eclipse segment indicate the hour of the day for which the eclipse is predicted to occur. As 223 synodic month equals 18 years, 11 days and 8 hours, there will always be a shift of 8 hours on the eclipse hour after each successive Sirius period. This is the basis of the Exaligmos cycle, representing 3 Saros cycles. For every second Saros cycle, indicated by the second segment of the dial, which displays this letter, indicating that 8 hours are to be added to the hour making. Consequently, the third segment for the third hour cycle displays the letter displayed there, meaning 16 hours are to be added accordingly. The Axeligmus pointer is based on three Saros cycles, and so one complete turn requires the Saros pointer to rotate 12 times, four turns per cycle multiplied by three cycles. The gearing ratio for the Exaligmos pointer is therefore equal to the Saros gearing ratio multiplied by 1 over 12. The Greek astronomer Meton of Athens, 5th century BC, observed that a period of 19 years is almost exactly equal to 235 synodic month and rounded to full days counts 6940 days. It regulates the 19 year cycle of intercalary month and helps adding accuracy to the mechanism. The Metonic calendar lasts 19 years and so 19 turns of the solar pointer completes one Metonic cycle. The Metonic dial itself consists of a spiral of 5 turns and therefore the Metonic pointer is required to rotate 5 times in each Metonic cycle. A groove following the spiral leads the Metonic pointer through to the end of the spiral which would then need to be reset to the original position by the user of the device. I chose not to model this groove that follows the spiral for a software reason. In Fusion 360, and that's one of the limitations I hit for this project, there is no joint that allows an object to follow a path. The only way to make it in my model is to use contact sets. Contact sets are very straightforward in theory. They enable contacts between components as if they were physical parts. The only problem with contact sets is the huge amount of memory needed, and because my model already counts a lot of joints and moving parts, adding contact sets would be just too much for the computer. The gearing ratio for the Metonic pointer is 5 over 19, so for every 19 turns of the solar pointer, the Metonic pointer rotates 5 times, thus completing the 5 turn spiral and Metonic cycle. Callipus of Sisychus in the 4th century BC devised a cycle to further improve on the accuracy of the Metonic calendar, and it's based on four consecutive Metonic cycles, which total 76 years. The four quadrants of the dial indicate the number of Metonic cycles from 1 through to 4, with the one day adjustment being made when the pointer reaches the end of the fourth quadrant. The gearing ratio of the Calipic pointer is 1 over 76. The game's dial bears a cultural significance rather than an astronomical one, as it indicates the year in which major competitive games were held across the Greek world. The four quadrants of the dial represent a cycle of four years, 
with each specifying two major games held in that year. The gearing ratio of the game's pointer is 1 over 4. The front side of the Antikythera mechanism comprises of a geocentric orrery, representing the cosmos, with the Earth at its center. Pointers representing the Sun and the Moon rotate around its circle, indicating the positions on two outer dials. Pointers for the five known planets would have been included on the original device, although the gearings for these pointers have not survived. The gearing ratio between the Moon pointer and the Solar pointer is 254 over 19. That is, there are 254 complete turns of the Moon pointer for every 19 turns of the Solar pointer, and is based on the sidereal month explained earlier. The pin and slot contraption on the gear train of the Moon pointer reproduces the varying speed of the Moon according to the anomalistic month. The Moon's orbit of the Earth is elliptical, with the point in the orbit closest to the Earth being the perigee, and the point further away the apogee. The period for the Moon's journey from apogee to apogee is the anomalistic month and comprises of approximately 27.55 days. This little, very smart contraption is one of the highlights of the mechanism and shows how advanced the Greeks were that age. It transforms the rotating speed of the Moon from linear to sinusoidal, because they already understood in 200 BC that the orbit of the Moon was in fact an ellipse around the Earth. Aligned with the Moon pointer is the Moon face display, which consists of a bee, half white, half black, connected to a gear train itself interlocked with the solar pointer. The gear train produces the actual rotation consistent with the changing phases of the Moon. The inferior planet mechanism includes the Sun, treated as a planet in this context, Mercury and Venus. For each of the three systems there is an epicyclic gear whose axis is mounted on B1, thus the basic frequency is the Earth year. Each meshes with a gear grounded to the mechanism frame. Each has a pin mounted but doesn't interfere with the teeth. As we've talked about previously, the Greeks used this model of epicycles as they observed from the Earth that the planets seem to wander back and forth in the sky. The pin and axle connected to each pointer represents this model. The superior planet systems, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, all follow the same general principle as the lunar anomaly mechanism. Similar to the inferior systems, each has a gear whose center pivot is on an extension of B1 and which meshes with a grounded gear. It presents a pin and a center pivot for the epicycle gear which has a slot for the pin and which meshes with a gear fixed to a coaxial tube and thence to the pointer. Each planet has its own gear ratio, calculated by the Greeks using past observations, and each gear train is linked to its own pointer on the front face of the mechanism. Investigations by Freeth and Jones revealed that their simulated mechanism is not particularly accurate, the Mars pointer being up to 38 degrees off at times. This is not due to inaccuracies in gearing ratios in the mechanism, but rather to inadequacies in the Greek theory. The accuracy could not have been improved until first Ptolemy put forth his planetary hypothesis in the second half of the second century AD, and then later the introduction of Kepler's second law in the early 17th century. In any case, there we have it, the Antikythera mechanism. My model and video are far from perfect from a mechanical and astronomical point of view, but I really hope you have enjoyed the video and you have learned interesting things today. And don't worry if you didn't understand it at all first, me neither. There are certainly still many unanswered questions. Why is it the only such device of its kind? Or was it simply the only to be preserved and then discovered? If this technology existed in the ancient world, why did it then disappear until the Middle Ages, 1500 years later? Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, don't hesitate to leave a like and subscribe for more videos like this. 
and I'll see you all in the next one.